Siwantira poisoning is the most common type of marine biotoxins food poisoning worldwide, caused by the consumption of marine species that have accumulated trace amounts of siwatoxins. While in some regions, mainly in tropical and subtropical areas, it has been known for centuries, its true incidence is not fully understood, with an estimation of 50,000 people affected every year. However, in the last decade, since 2008, autochthonous outbreaks have been reported in Europe, specifically in Spain and Portugal, in the Macaronesi area. Siwatira poisoning is predicted to become one of the increasing food safety threats due to climate change and globalization of trade, which might also contribute to its spread. The Spanish Food Safety and Nutrition Agency, ISAM, communicates the emerging of Siwatira cases and outbreaks in European waters to the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA and it was assessed by EFSA's network of emerging risk. As a result of the discussion, EFSA co-founded a multinational European project, EuroSiwa, which started in the spring of 2016 and will end in January 2021, with the general goal of characterizing the risk of Siwatira in the European Union. The Euro C1 project is a framework partnership agreement in which 15 European scientific institutions from six member states, Spain, Portugal, France, Germany, Greece and Cyprus, participate and is coordinated by ISM. Euro C1 project also has an advisory board of excellence with experts from United States and Japan and collaborates with European institutions such as EFSA, European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC, Joint Research Center, JRC, and the European Commission are part of this advisory board. This Hiroshima International Workshop, conducted online, was attended by a total of 100 participants. All members and collaborators of the Eurosiwa Project Consortium from European Union nations, members of advisory board and international experts from other areas around the world, such as Norway, United States, Canada, Australia and Japan. Apart from the participation of the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, the event is also attended by representatives from the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC, and the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO. DC Rosiwa International Workshop provided an ideal platform for researchers around the world to present their latest findings related to the risk assessment of Siwateria poisoning as well as for members of public institutions working on risk management. This event was an opportunity to exchange knowledge about Siwatera and to discuss risk management possibilities in Europe and worldwide. Dr. Ana Canals, Scientific and International Advisor of the Spanish Food Safety and Nutrition Agency, ISAM is the head of the coordination and management team of the Eurosiwa project. I think uh, it was 2008 when uh, the first outbreaks of Siwatera poisoning were recorded in the Canary Islands and in Madeira. The Spanish Agency for Food Safety and Nutrition, ISAN, was very well aware of the problem because the competent authorities of the Canary Islands came to the agency to explain uh, the problem they have, the public health uh, problem. So uh, this problem was uh, brought up the attention of the European Food Safety Authority of EFSA and uh, a project was assembled, was put together and it was uh, funded, co-financed by the authority. The main goal of Eurocigua is to characterize the risk of uh, Ciguatera in the European Union. Eurocigua is divided into four independent specific agreements. 
Management and Scientific Coordination, with ISAN as the leading institution, Epidemiology, coordinated by the National Center for Epidemiology of the Carlos III Health Institute, Evaluation of Sewotoxins in Seafood and Environment, coordinated by the Institute of Agri-Food Research and Technology, IRTA in Spanish, and characterization of sewotoxins present in the European Union, including the development of reference materials led by the University of Vigo. The National Center for Epidemiology from the Carlos III Health Institute is responsible for the establishment of a CWA-TIRA case definition and the identification of data sources for outbreaks and cases of this illness. Dr. Carmen Varela is the coordinator. She is a specialist in microbiology and Master of Science in field epidemiology. She is epidemiology scientist since 2002 currently leading the surveillance of food and waterborne diseases, including cases and outbreaks. Um, hello, hi everybody. Um, I'm going to, to explain a little bit of the epidemiology of Ciguatera in the European Union. And the objective of this work that I'm going to present uh, is the estimation of the incidence and the description of the epidemiological characteristic of Ciguatera in the European Union and European Economic Area. Um, as you may know, the true is the, the bottom of the pyramid, the, the exposed people, but the real thing that we can have in, in our surveillance is the, the top of the pyramid, the cases that are reported. The activities we carry out to accomplish the objective are the following, and I'm going to, to explain. Then we start with the surveillance protocol. We create this to have common guidelines to carry out the surveillance of Ciguatera at European Union level in a harmonized uh, way. Uh, primarily, this was addressed to public health authorities. We developed a specific questionnaire for case and outbreak reporting. This questionnaire includes case information, mainly age and sex, and information on the disease, the symptoms and hospitalization, etc. And information on the fish consumed, the type of fish, the um, origin of the fish, the size, different information. And the data from the laboratory, if the detection of the CTX has been done, and if uh, analysis of the species of the fish were done as well. And the measure that has been implemented, uh, a specific measure uh, on treatment, but any other measure. And the last part was the classification of the cases. We will see uh, what, what is this classification and classification of the outbreaks. The protocol was translated into Spanish and the questionnaire that were developed were uh, are currently used in the routine surveillance of Ciguatera in the Canary Island. This is the, now we are talking about the case definition. We, we create this with a multidisciplinary group and we create the case definition by consensus. We take into account different case definition that already were, were done, the one from the CDC or the one from Florida or the one from the Canary Island but the structure was similar to the one used for case definition at the European Union level um, with, with a clinical criteria, laboratory criteria and epidemiological criteria at the classification of the cases as possible, probable and confirmed cases. The next one, please. We uh, create a list of fish that previously has been associated with Ciguatera. We have uh, almost 200 fish species, but it's not a closed list and it has been updated regularly. Next one. The classification of cases I mentioned previously, we have at the bottom of the slide, the confirmed cases is a person meeting the diagnostic criteria. That means with neurological symptoms and uh, with, uh, that has consumed a fish that has been um, detected in which 
has been detected the ciguatoxins. We have the probable cases that are a person with neurological symptoms and with the consumption of a fish that previously has been associated with ciguatera. And for possible cases, we have person with these neurological symptoms and that has consumed a fish with, a, with an unknown type or that previously has not been associated with ciguatera. The next one. And for outbreak definition, we take into account the definition of the um, zoonosis directive and we, we use the same one. Uh, is two or more cases with an epidemiological link. And we have different def definition for different types of outbreak. We, we name uh, autochthonous outbreaks when the outbreak is produced by the consumption of a um, fish from the European Union. Um, imported outbreaks when the fish consumed is, ha has been imported from outside the European Union and travel reported travel related outbreaks when the cases consume the fish in tropical endemic areas but they are citizens from the European Union we exclude the residents from tropical endemic areas even if they are from the European Union as for instance Martinique or Guadeloupe the next one please um, the, the following uh, activity was the data sources, where to find this information on cases and outbreaks. The next one. At country level, there are different, or we identify different data sources that can provide information on, on Ciguatera. Uh, for our um, project or, or what we found is that the first one, the public health sur uh, surveillance system, public health authorities and the, um, at the bottom of, of the slide, the food safety authorities are the ones that provide more information on outbreaks. The information comes together from these two sources. The general practitioner record um, or MS, uh, hospital emergency record or hospital discharge record we have no, no got any information from, from them. We have to take into account that the classification of, this, of diseases from WHO number uh, nine did not have any specific um, record for, for these ciguatoxins. They don't have any specific code. Only the 10 have this specific code. In, in Spain, we ask the hospital discharge record if they got any ciguatera record but only from 2016 because this is when they start using this code from the 10 version but they they did not have any record on, on that from the poison center we got some information uh, we are going to see how is this information and as well for travel and tropical medicine units these travel and tropical medicine units, we got information only from Spain because we contacted them directly and we, we contacted three units from three different hospitals in Spain, two from Madrid and one from Catalonia. And as well, we contacted a network, a Spanish network on tropical diseases and we got information for, from another tropical unit. And for the vital statistic, the, for vital statistic, this international classification for diseases from WHO, the 10th version with this specific code for Ciguatera, uh, it has been used for many years and we asked in, in Spain, but we couldn't find any, any record on that. We will see in the, in the results that we got one from Germany. Next one, please. At the European level, uh, possible data sources were the database for, for football outbreaks from yeah, the European Food Safety Authority, and we got information from them, but all that information was as well uh, collected from the member states that, that reported to EFSA. Uh, as well, from the European Centre for Diseases Prevention and Control, as uh, Ciguatera is not a mandatory disease, disease in the European Union, they don't have 
a record on, on that cases, but there is a system for epidemic intelligence information that can share this, this type of alert or, of, or, or information. And only once has been used for marine biotoxins and it was not for Ciguatera. As well, there are different alert systems, the early warning and response system, um, at that uh, platform, no uh, alerts on Ciguatera were recorded. The rapid alert system for food and feed, yeah, they, they have uh, several uh, alerts there, but all of them as well were reported by the, by the member states. And this RASCHEM network, that is a voluntary network for chemical alerts, one of the, of the outbreaks that occurred in Germany in 2012 was recorded here in, in this um, network and as well was reported by the country and by, by the RAS network. And from WHO, we have not got any, any report on Ciguatera. Next one, please. There are as well other possible data sources for during the outbreak investigation. And I know that in Germany, they have used uh, all, all these data sources and, and maybe more as uh, Germany is going to present uh, the, the data. Maybe they can explain something on, on that. Next one, please. And we, we create, uh, next one, please. We create a specific um, database or a specific uh, um, met metadata for collecting the cases in the Spanish database that we use for the surveillance of epidemiological diseases. This is an online base to, to record the, the data and after can be transferred to EFSA or, or wherever. Next one, please. And the, the last activity was the analysis of the data we collected and, and the report of, the, of all this information. Next one. In summary, uh, there has been 28 outbreaks reported to, to the project from 2012-2019 that included 194 cases. 16 of these outbreaks were autochthonous outbreaks reported by Spain and Portugal. Eight were imported um, fish outbreak uh, reported by France and Germany, and four were travel related outbreaks reported by France and, and Spain. Next one. Um, this is the, uh, the this figure shows the outbreaks along the, the time, and as you can see, there are no more outbreaks in the last years even it could be that there is a, a decrease on, of the number of outbreaks. The next one. This is the size of the outbreaks. How many cases are per outbreak, the, the median of the cases? And as you can see, the, the first figure in, on the top, uh, on, on the left, are the autochthonous outbreaks. And it seems that the number of the uh, cases in, out, in the outbreaks decrease. In, in recent years. This could be due to um, better control of the outbreaks or that the awareness on, and, and the detection has been uh, strengthened and even small outbreaks has been detected. For imported outbreaks, there are less outbreaks and it's not so clear the picture, but it's not clear that there is not an, an increase in the size of the outbreaks in, in recent years. For travel related, these outbreaks are really small, only two cases, the, the median of these uh, outbreaks. Next one, please. Uh, regarding the symptoms, all the cases has neurological symptoms as it was a requirement, requirement of our case definition. For gastrointestinal symptoms, most of the cases on, on the outbreaks has uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, except three outbreaks from Spain that were due to different feces from different locations. And for the cardio cardiovascular symptoms, uh, they were only reported in six outbreaks and they were due to feces from different locations and different species. Uh, it could be possible that this uh, there is an under-reporting of these symptoms. 
rotis cardiovascular symptoms. There's one, please. Regarding cases, all the information around all the results I showed you were related to outbreaks. And when we talk about single cases, we got that information, uh, 24 cases, and they were mainly from Spain. We have the first one from Germany, 2012, that it was uh, from vital statistics, and we know that this person was uh, dead, but we don't got any other information on, on it. Um, from Poison Center and Travel and Tropical Medicine Units, we got that information from Spain, Switzerland, Austria, and Portugal. But as you can see, there are many blanks because the information was poor, and for the fish species, we don't got, got many information. The next one, um, the Marseille Ponson Center, the, the person uh, responsible uh, of, of this in, in the Marseille Ponson, Poison Center is going to give a talk as well and can explain more on, on the data. But I only wanted to show you that uh, we couldn't um, aggregate this data to or add this data to the other because it was aggregated data. We know that they have between 2012 and 2019, 73 cases of ciguatera related to travel and five related to imported fees. And as well, they have 13 outbreaks and one, uh, 13 outbreaks related to travel and one related to import fees. But we don't know how many cases in each outbreak. And the most, um, the, the family most involved in this outbreak were the Lujanide and Serranide. Next one. As conclusions, the information on outbreaks was provided mainly by public health and food safety authorities, and on single cases was provided by Poison Center and Travel and Tropical Medicine Units, and the information was not complete, was scarce and, and poor. The incident rate of the Ciguatera reported cases in the European Union Economic European Area was very low for, for that period between 2012 and 2019. And the number of outbreaks reported have not increased last year. Outbreaks due to, to consumption of fish from the European Union, this called auto, autochthonous outbreaks, were reported only by Canary Island and Madeira and outbreaks due to imported fees were reported only by Germany and France, even if we know that the fees involved were distributed in other European countries. Next one. Next slide, please. Uh, and the hospitalization rate varies from 1.4%, uh, excuse me, the previous one, thank you. 1.4% in Spain to 84% in Portugal, but we don't got enough information to analyze uh, the next one, please, to analyze that. Uh, that could be due to many different factors. And the type of fish more frequently associated with Ciguatera in the European Union were grouper and amberjack for autochthonous fish and lujanos for imported fish. The presentation of Carmen Varela has included the contributions of Dr. Mar Lago. She is a specialist in travel medicine from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And the contributions of Domingo Núñez, specialist in preventive medicine and public health. He is currently head of the Epidemiology and Prevention Service of the General Directorate of Public Health of the Canary Islands Health Service. The main objective focuses on the description of the surveillance system of Siwatiria in the Canary Islands. Also, Dr. Luke Deado, Doctor in Medical Toxicology, Health Impact of Natural Toxins, and in Neurotoxicology, presented the experience of the French Poison Control Center Network since 2012 to 2019 regarding to Siwatiria poisoning. So the discussion of the clinical feature, onset one to 18 hours after the meal, uh, average is five hours, median three hours, so very short time. Uh, the clinical feature is really homogeneous, except for digestive symptoms. 
because if we look uh, the details of the digestive symptoms, 91% of the patients of the Atlant in the Atlantic Ocean had uh, clinical uh, uh, digestive symptoms, and only 44% uh, of the patients in the Pacific. And this is a, a difference we always have uh, during all the studies we make between the different parts of the uh, overseas France with uh, this uh, poisoning. Uh, the duration of the symptoms one to 45 week, weeks in all series, uh, with a median about eight weeks. This is the uh, average of uh, eight weeks and median five weeks. This is a long illness. And uh, as we said before, that recurrences, and we in this case, we in this area, we had recurrences after eating fish with uh, 19 patients and after drinking alcohol with uh, 23 patients. Uh, the treatment is not the subject today, is my, my subject, but is not the subject of, the, of today. Dr. Johanna Takinen, the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC, plays a key role in this project related to the notification of Siwatira cases and outbreaks. Dr. Johanna Takinen represents this institution. She works at the ECDC since 2005. She's currently a senior expert in food and waterborne diseases, coordinating the European Food and Waterborne Diseases and Zoonosis Network, and further developing enhanced surveillance for selected foodborne diseases. So I will give you a short uh, overview of how the surveillance of infectious diseases have been organized in the EU. So it's important to look into the criteria how these different diseases are selected to be covered by EU-wide indicator-based surveillance. First, if these diseases or related special health issues like antimicrobial resistance or healthcare associated infections cause or may cause significant morbidity or mortality across the union. And particularly if the of these diseases requires a coordination at the union level. Secondly, if there is an important, important uh, to exchange the information to provide early warning of threats to public health so that all different countries are uh, warned in advance. There may also be rare and serious infectious diseases that could not be recognized at the national level and where only the pooling of data would allow the hypothesis generation of the cause of the diseases. Fourth, there needs to be an effective preventive measure available, which really gives the gain to protect health. And for fifth, if the comparison by member states of the occurrence of these diseases contributes to the evaluation of national, national and union programs, this is the fifth criterion. The conclusions that we can draw from based on the available criteria and systems in place in the EU for surveillance of communicable diseases, it's that Sequatera unfortunately does not really fulfill the existing criteria as a disease to be covered by EU-wide surveillance. So far, we have only one intoxication under EU-wide surveillance, and that is botulism. However, Countries are obliged to report Sequatera events through EWRS if the criteria for this is fulfilled, are fulfilled. Also, EPIS platform can be used for informal assessment and sharing information and to assess the possible cross-border dimension. Frank Bolaer. Related to outbreaks investigation and reporting, the European Food Safety Authority, EPSA, is represented by Dr. Frank Boiler. He is a veterinary public health professional with 30 years work experience. His job consists in surveying and monitoring zoonosis in the European Union 
along all the stages of the food chains, and he manages the production of the annual European Union One Health Zoonosis Reports. Uh, and ask a bit talk about food borne outbreaks investigation reporting in the EU. Uh, and of course, with a focus also in the last slides on, on the Shigwa toxin uh, food borne outbreaks. Um, so, food borne outbreaks reporting. So, we're talking about outbreaks or so about disease outbreaks, as, uh, as Carmen, you explained. So, an outbreak where at least uh, two people fall ill uh, due to the same food uh, consumption, food item, food matrix, right? So, um, yeah, about food borne outbreaks in the EU, there is. Uh, so, uh, there is legislation, it is known as a directive, so since uh, 2003. So it's a directive, there is some member state specific interpretation, it's not like a regulation, but there is legislation, and, and in this directive, okay, there is about uh, the monitoring of the zoonosis and zoonotic agents. Eh? You know, there's a couple of mandatory annual reportings for zoonosis, and a couple of uh, based on the epidemiological situation, but for food bond outbreaks, this is mandatory, so member states should investigate the food bond outbreaks uh, occurring in their territory and should uh, report uh, on the trends on that and should report uh, a specific set of data annually uh, to the EU level. Uh, that is, uh, so we have an agreement that uh, to the EU level means indeed uh, the, the one single entry point is now in, 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 in EFSA. So, uh, yeah, a data warehouse. So annual data needs to be submitted. Uh, it's also specified which data should be. Yeah? So it's really the outcomes, the number of outbreaks, the number of human cases, the number of hospitalized cases, the number of death, the, the factors associated. And, and okay, so the investigations, you need to document those. And in Article 9, okay, EFSA uh, has a general mandate, so we should uh, uh, look at the data of all the summaries of the member states and, and, and make a summary and publish this uh, summary report that is now called the One Health uh, Zoonosis uh, Summary Report. So it's about the zoonosis and these football outbreaks and it's mainly those data that can be helpful for the international policy setting. Eh? And also for the for the football outbreaks have been going to the reporting. So the members need to report, uh, need to monitor and report. And since 2004, we have had uh, a uh, technical specifications update. Okay, we're talking about strong evidence, uh, meaning that uh, uh, member states should classify, and strong evidence means that, that they are quite sure about which is the implicated food stuff. Okay, uh, not evidence related that it's a food board outbreak or not. But uh, uh, so, and the weak evidence, okay, there's only weak strength of evidence that uh, it is this or other food that is causing, that has caused. The, the, the disease outbreak, right? Um, about the Shigwa toxin uh, food bond outbreaks, here we have an, an overview slide in 2018. So the last year, you see that you had 12 reported, uh, at least to the system, reported uh, Shigwa toxin food bond disease outbreaks. 12, 12 by two countries, 11 outbreaks by France, one by Spain, and um, indeed 49 cases six hospitalized and no deaths. And you see there also the, the, the numbers, the statistics for the previous years, right? Uh, meaning that in 2018, uh, let's say 0.2% were uh, of all the food burn outbreaks were due to, to Shigwa toxin, huh? whether it's, um, so yeah, that is what the data, uh, data reported to us, reported by two member states in France and Spain, also mentioned by Carmen. And, and you have had a number of cases hospitalized. So this is reported to, to us. And then you see in the previous years, uh, these, uh, the, these statistics, right? So in total, in total of, of these uh, six years, going back six years, um, uh, we have like uh, 173 uh, uh, Shigotoxin disease outbreaks, uh, 661 human cases, and, and Times hospitalizations, and there was one dead, uh, one dead, uh, one uh, person died, and it was in 2014, and and it was reported by by France, right? Okay, so this is a very general overview. Um, if you look then to the outbreaks where the member states reported to us, 
So the investigation team, okay, this is one with the strong evidence related to the implicated food vehicle. So um, we had, uh, uh, let's say in, in 2018, none, none was reported of these 12, none was with strong evidence regarding the implicated food vehicle, 42 in total of these six years, 42. Huh? So uh, you can see there the statistics. Um, and for instance, okay, uh, in, in 2013, 5, 15, so strong evidence food banana. Just to clarify a bit this table. Eh? So again, 173 in total, but uh, let's say one, one, one fourth, eh? one fourth, uh, 42 over all these years with strong evidence. If you then look at, um, okay, and this is then the weak evidence, this is just a complementary then, 131 uh, with uh, weak evidence as regarding it was this or that food that was uh, implicated. And then, so which were the food vehicles reported to us? And for this reporting, we have like a, a catalog system. Yeah, for this 42, uh, let's say 69%, uh, almost 70% uh, up pain. The upper pain you can see were due to fish and fish products. Yeah, and then okay, 30%, uh, 31% due to uh, crustacean shell, fish molecules, and products thereof. Huh? So this is like yeah, the, the, the summary statistics. And this 42 you can see down. They reported by France and Spain, uh, and also uh, two uh, by Germany. Yeah, two two by Germany and Germany reported those. This is my concluding slide. You have there the overview statistics. Huh? So who countries reported uh, the, the outbreaks? And so on average, we have uh, over the six year, uh, 29 outbreaks a year, 110 uh, human cases a year, an, uh, an average from four per outbreak. Uh, one in 10 of these persons uh, needed hospitalization. And, and uh, okay, for the total number of cases, so you see a toxin, 0.15%. Uh, died, uh, so one out of this uh, 661, and we do not do any trends analysis on this data. Dr. Medium Friedman, the German Federal Institute for Risk Assessment, BFR, presented their studies on outbreaks, investigation and reporting. Dr. Medium Friedman, since 2002, works in a senior scientist dedicating especially to uncommon causes of food poisoning in BFR. I told you about the German publications in tourists and it's very important because they were published in German, the German uh, language before the onset of the outbreaks. Now I want to see the Third, the third one, next please. Uh, there's a map of Germany where you can see the the points, uh, the points demonstrate where where the outbreaks took part. Uh, the first outbreak in 2012, and uh, the red points demonstrate back, please, to Germany, to the map of Germany. And the green one, they represent where the fish ca causing the outbreak was delivered to. Uh, interesting is that the information about the amounts of fish delivered to more than uh, 200 selling points in Germany. These informations we became from the rapid alert system. And so there could be contacted some more uh, selling points and uh, there could be found some more patients. Uh, in, in summary, there were nine clusters. Uh, that are uh, nine cities with uh, 23 cases in the first outbreak. And at the beginning of the outbreak, it was uh, only an outbreak in the Northern Pass. And later, then there became known cases in the southern parts. So you could say it's a, an outbreak uh, which were present, uh, which was present in whole Germany. Next, demonstrating uh, the way of information. Uh, the main information came from the poisoning centers. Uh, and 
where physicians and affected people were calling to and the poisoning information center, they got in contact with public health authorities. And so the BFR was informed about the um, cases of the in the first outbreaks. In later outbreaks, physicians directly connected or called to the BFR as well as affected people. Other data than the clinical data uh, were those concerning the fish and those information we got from the wholesalers or from retail sale sailors. So, and this information uh, could be achieved by, uh, by the rapid alert system for food and feed. So, so the objectives of the investigations were to assess the number of Silicaterra cases in Germany during the study period 2012 to 2019, identification of data sources, sources I just summarized uh, in the slide before, and the elucidation of background information, e.g. what fish kind of fishes was uh, consumed and uh, interesting, an interesting point is the clarification of a possible epidemiological context between single cases because in non-endemic areas it is typical that you become aware about single cases and it is not easy to put them together and to know that it's an outbreak. So, so I want to, and I want to focus on conclusions again on, on the ICD-10 or 11 based data of hospitalized and uh, outpatients that they should be used more. So thank you. That was my presentation. Specific agreement number three is focused in the evaluation of CWA toxins in seafood and environment. The coordinator of this specific agreement is Dr. Jorge Diogin. Jorge is currently Senior Research Scientist and Head of the Marine and Continental Waters Program at IRTA in Catalonia, Spain. Uh, what I want to do in, in my short presentation now is to introduce the specific Grant 3, which was oriented to the evaluation of seaweed toxins in seafood and the environment. All right. Okay, the main goals of the specific grant were to evaluate the presence of seaweed toxins in fish and the presence also of uh, toxin producing microalgae of the genera Gambierdiscus and Fukuyoa, we included it later. Um, and that was in strategic hotspots of Macaronesia and the Mediterranean waters. The second was to identify fish species which represent a risk for human consumption. Uh, then the idea was to obtain primary reference material containing seaweed toxins, that is microalgae and fish. And then uh, to obtain literature data on, uh, on uh, to better understand the ecology of Ciguatera. Uh, this resulted in a description of sites. Uh, I have just taken this example in the Mediterranean. Description of sites where the species were present. Uh, the dimension of the project didn't allow us to quantify the amount of microalgae present. So we went just for a present absence uh, of Gambierdiscus and Fukuyoa. Uh, so uh, regarding taxonomy, as I pointed out, we had to go to uh, morphological analysis using electron microscopy or molecular genetics. And as a result, the project had a quite a high number of, of samples processed. And that is a little summary of the effort for Gambierdiscus species. There were uh, 487 isolated strains. Um, from different areas, Canary Islands, Madeira, Cyprus, Balearic Islands, so fulfilling the requirements that we had uh, in, in the proposal. We also uh, quantified the toxicity according to ctx one b equivalents, so we could uh, estimate the potency of the strains. Then for the fish, again, we had uh, 1,174 uh, fish obtained, 
that was uh, much higher than the tentative plan. We wanted to be sure that we succeeded. And again, uh, the evaluation of the cytotoxin fish. That was an example uh, of a species of fish that was, I took the example from Madeira, where uh, we had a record of the species, the weight, the, the, the length of the fish uh, among the species, the, the positive one among the, the, um, the total amount of fish, and then the proportion of uh, positive versus the total fish obtained. Okay. Okay. So the conclusions of the work was that first, the, we harmonized the cell base for cytotoxin detection in comparative analysis among laboratories. Then uh, the sampling of Gambiritiscus and Fukuyoa uh, was correct, and as well as the establishment of the desired number of strains. Uh, the sampling of Gambiritiscus was conducted also recording environmental data. Uh, the taxonomy of Gambiridiscus was successful. We were able to identify species according to morphological and genetic approach. Uh, the, for the first time, Gambiridiscus was detected in the Western Mediterranean in the Balearic Islands. Okay, and the last conclusion is that cytotoxicity shows cytotoxicity in Gambiridiscus from Canary Islands, Madeira, Crete, Balearic Islands. We conduct a large scale cultures to send to University, University of Vigo. And uh, we were successful in evaluating the toxicity of fish. And interesting, there was one fish from Cyprus that for which uh, toxicity, ciguatoxin like toxicity was reported by the cell base essay and an immuno essay, but uh, due to the amount, small amounts. It was not detected in uh, in um, by LCMS. Okay, so that's about it. Paloma Garcia Collia, the Department of Public Health Service of Government of the Canary Islands, is represented by Dr. Paloma Garcia Collia. She's member of the Working Group of Food and Nutrition at the Directorate of Public Health of the government of the Canary Islands. She explains the epidemiologic situation in the Canary Islands. Ciguatira poisoning was included in the list of mandatory notifiable diseases. Paloma presented the experimental design for fish sampling within the official control and the main result focusing on species and sizes for which gaps existed. As the Canary Health Service, this has been the major contribution to the project. Experimental, experimental design for the sampling of fish focusing on species and sizes for which gap existed. Facilitating fish samples to the project, building complementary data on fish toxicity in order to have the most complete information on seawater in the Canary Island. Analysis of result and discussion transferring the information retrieved in the Eurosiwa project to improve the management of Siwatera in the Canary Island. Regarding to Siwa toxins in fish from Canary Islands, the Institute of Animal Health and Food Safety of the University of Las Palmas of Gran Canaria has been the institution in charge of this work. Dr. Natalia Garcia, is a specialist on quality control in pharmaceutical and diagnostic laboratories. And Dr. Fernando Real, professor of the Institute of Animal Health and Food Safety of the University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria, presents their main results. Natalia Garcia and me from the University Institute of Animal Health and Food Safety in the University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria will expose you our main results in the Erosiva project with the presentation entitled CTS Detection in Marine Fish in the Canary Islands. Hello everyone, my name is Natalia. As Fernando introduced, we work at the University of Las Palmas and as part of the SA3, we were in charge of the fish sampling from the Canary Islands the screening for cytotoxin detection through cytotoxicity assay, uh, CBA, and we were also involved in the harmonization of methodologies and selection of material for SA4. About material, we worked on 865 fish 
uh, from the Canary Islands divided into two groups based on a specific purposes. The first one was uh, 118 fish uh, from the official control of the DG fisheries of the Canary government available for SA4 objectives. The second group uh, were 747 fish of the proper Eurosiwa sampling for that analysis as agreed coming from different sources, such as fish purchase, spot fishing, PETHIWA monitoring, as our colleague talked about before, a punctual monitoring from El Hierro, uh, and samples linked to human outbreaks and other sources. Uh, regarding the second group, the proper Eurosiwa sampling, here we, we show in this pie chart and the total results considering all species, in blue, negative ones, in red, the positive ones. So we obtained 106 uh, fish positive from 747. That uh, represents 14% of cybertoxic fish. Now we'll discuss the data analysis uh, considering different influence variables. So now different results according to sample sourcing. Uh, here in blue, again, the negative, in red, the positive with different positive percentages. For example, 9% from fish purchase, we obtained 27 uh, positive results from spot fishing, 17 from PESIWA, 14 from the uh, that punctual monitoring, and we also received six samples linked to human outbreaks of Siwatera, and the presence of cyatoxin was uh, confirmed in all of them. As you all know, Canary Islands are located in the North Atlantic Ocean near Europe and North Africa and include seven islands. Here we show you the spatial distribution of our results and we, we found a significant difference between islands. We plotted on this map uh, the values compiled as one for positive percentage less than one, mm, sorry, less than 10. That is the case of uh, Fuerteventura, Gran Canaria and La Gomera with number two uh, for percentage from 10 to 20. That's the case of Lanzarote, Tenerife and La Palma. And with the number three, when the positive percentage was more than 20%, that was the case of El Hierro, uh, which seems to, to be a hotspot area for cyatoxin presence. Okay, let's go something with, um, according with the remarkable species, so, amberjack is one of the most important fish species regarding CTS detection in Ergosigua in the Canary Islands. Statistically, significant difference has been found with regard to number of positives and the capture season, warm or cold, as you can see in this figure. Therefore, also there is no evidence of Ciguatera outbreaks caused by siblings in the Canary Islands, but uh, this species is known to be uh, carriers of ciguatoxin. You can see here the feeding habits that they have. Besides amberjack, dusky grouper is one of the more important species investigated in this project. Based on the official data provided by the Canary government, this is one of the species involved in Ciguatera fish poison cases in the Canary archipelago. 32 people resulted poisoned. It can be found in all the islands in till 200 meters deep and you can see in this slide uh, uh, its living habits. Let me introduce you a group of fish species that must be emphasized according to the results obtained in this project. These species are the Mori eels. Ten Mori eels species cohabit in the Canary Islands environment. In addition, they are also important fish species for human consumption in this region. And among the five more uh, prevalent more uh, ill species in the Canary Islands regarding CTS like toxicity, we have found the next the functional mori, the black mori, brown mori, polygon mori, and Mediterranean mori. As we are showing you now, this slide highlights the positive results found for functal mori 100% and followed by black mori 44% here in this slide and occurring less frequently with brown mori and Mediterranean mori. And a very interesting fact is to consider the interaction between dusky grouper and mori eels in the natural environment. Different 
grouper and more ill species have been considered responsible for many seawatera fish poisoning outbreaks in the Indic, Pacific and Atlantic region. In order to document this interaction, one dusky grouper of Erosiwa project was submitted to the necropsy services in the veterinary faculty with the data we are showing now. 17.4 kilograms and 93 centimeters length and was captured in La Santa in the north of Lanzarote. Our point five is to show you some relevant data regarding the Hierro Island. High contamination rate has been obtained for some fish species investigated in Erosiwa. For instance, 75% for siblings and 33% for Mori eels analyzed. It must be considered at the same uh, time that similar results have been previously reported showing high percentage, 19.9% of CTX light toxicity in dusky group analysis uh, analyzed in the official control protocol established by the Canary uh, government. We have to take into account that parallel to these events, an alga bloom by Cambridisco Caribe occurred in this island in October 2016. All these facts considered together suggest the Hierro Islands as a ciguatoxin hotspot in the Canary archipelago. This effect should be studied in greedy depth. And finally, let's go to our conclusions. First, this work confirms the Canary Islands as an area of expansion of ciguatera fish poisoning endemicity and highlights the need to monitor CTX accumulation in fish and the presence of gambit discos in the Canary Islands marine water. Second, 40% of the study of fish resulted positive to CTX, 60 species were evaluated and 17 saw CTX like toxicity. Third, among positive fish species found, amberjack, dusky grouper, some mori eels and common two-banded siblings must be stressed. Fourth, for amberjack, several factors were found significantly associated with the probability of contamination by CTS like toxicity, such as weight of fish and season of capture. Five, for dusky grouper, the island of fishing was significantly associated with CTS like toxicity. Six, the presence of CCTX1 in Black Moray, Fangtooth Moray, Mediterranean Moray, and Brown Moray has been found for the first time in the Canary Archipelago. Seventh, further research is needed to assess the risk that Moray eels would represent to human health according to their consumption levels. And fourth and last, a high percentage of fish from several species captured in El Hierro has shown a presence of CTS like toxicity. This fact considered together with previous results obtained suggests the island, this island, as a ciguatoxin hotspot in the Canary Archipelago. Related to Gambia discus and ciguatoxins in fish from Madeira and Salvagens, Dr. Pedro Reis Costa presents the main results. He's a researcher in the Portuguese Institute of Ocean and Atmosphere and he's team member of the National Monitoring Programme for Marine Toxins. Um, the work I'm going to present about Gambia discus and ciguatoxins in fish from the Portuguese, in, from the Portuguese waters, was not possible without the participation of several colleagues of mine and that I have to highlight in the first instance. And uh, they are Lucia Solino, uh, Lia Godinho, Catarina Churro and Susana Rodrigues uh, from IPMA. Uh, I also have to highlight the collaboration with the government of Madeira, more specifically with uh, Neide Gouveia and Viriat Timotio from Fisheries Department of Madeira government and Carolina Santos from Natural Park of Madeira of the National Institute for Nature Conservation. The aim of the Eurosigua, uh, which is focused on the evaluation of cigua toxins in seafood and the environment, our tasks were mainly devoted for sampling and sampling seawater for Gambier discus identification and isolation and sampling fish for toxins and toxins determination. So during the four years of the project, we carried out five main field campaigns. 
we started to rely on opportunistic sampling for Gambier discs in 2016, um, immediately after the kickoff meeting of Erosigua. And then in 2017, we implemented a fortnight sampling strategy of Gambier discs in south coast of Madeira and Salvation Islands. Uh, we also uh, keep relying on opportunistic sampling in the north coast of Madeira. Um, regarding fish, we obtained opportunistic samples from Madeira and Selvagens during 2017. And in the end of this period, these two, uh, two years or one and a half year of sampling and analysis, we, we stopped to make a balance of the, of the findings. And then we decided uh, to reorganize our sampling because results were indicating that um, higher incidence of gambier discs and toxins in fish were occurring in Salvagen Islands. So we prepared um, a cruise, a scientific cruise for intensive fish and gambier discus sampling in Salvagen Island in September 2018. And finally, last year, uh, we increased efforts of, for sampling Gambier discus in Madeira Island with particular attention to the north coast. Um, so in total, we collected uh, 91 live samples for Gambier discus isolation, uh, mostly from Selvagens and Madeira Island, four from Desertas, two, two from Porto Santo. Uh, in the end, uh, we were able to isolate uh, 86 strains, 72 from Selvagem, 13 from Madeira, and one from Desertes. We also collect uh, 200 other samples for uh, assessing the presence of Gambier discus and for quantification of cells, mostly from Madeira, and some from Selvagem, and very few from Desertes and Porto Santo. Um, regarding, regarding fish, um, we collected 131 samples, mostly from Selvagens, 76, 49 from Madeira, five from Desertas, and one from Portugal mainland. All these samples were from uh, 18, 18 species, a total of 18 species. Uh, in terms of fish presence, uh, in terms of fish and presence of toxins in fish, we have to say that almost all of the positive samples as determined by cell-based assay, were caught in Salvagen Islands. Uh, cell assays were carried out at IRTA, as already described by Jorge. And um, in this graph, we want to, to show a little bit uh, the picture, the idea. And we plotted the fish species according their position in the food web. The two species with lower position were the ones which never tested positive for CTX-like toxicity. The highest levels were found in Budienus crofa, um, a hogfish with an intermediate position in the food web. And we also detected high levels in top predators, such as bar barracudas, and although not consistently, in amberjacks. And then um, after, after the toxicity assays, uh, samples were selected for LCMS-MS analysis. Um, which was uh, done by Anagago Martin, Martin's team, uh, who will give more details and all the details tomorrow uh, on her presentation. So I only have to say that uh, she found the predominant compound, C, C, the Caribbean CTX1, but of course, um, Professor Anagago will explain tomorrow much better than what I have to say. So uh, this is the main picture of a very brief and fast picture of, of what we have been doing during these four years. And uh, we may highlight a few certain conclusions, such as Selvagem Islands are for sure the main spot for ciguatera in Portugal. I can bear this cell densities and fish toxicity were observed in, as in samples from Selvagem Islands. Gambier this Australis was the only and single species identified in salvagens, and the uh, analysis of phylogenetic relations indicates some diverging strains from uh, Gambardis australis clade. We, we want to perform, we are performing more studies, and we have to continue, not only in this topic, but uh, we will see much other topics. 
Well, Gambier disc eccentrics was also the single species in Madeira. And um, the results indicate for a predominance in the north coast. We have to confirm these, these findings. And um, CTX uh, toxicity was observed in several fish throughout the marine food web, not only in the top predators. And uh, it is something of, that uh, I've been also listening to our previous uh, colleagues uh, with the same finding, which is very interesting. And we have to continue to uh, investigate this topic of new vectors of new, um, of, or I mean, other species not usually related with the sigma toxins. So finally, uh, just to say that the predominant compound appear to be Caribbean C CTX1, uh, as according to the results of the specific rent for. And um, that's all. Dr. Katerina Alijisaki from the Laboratory Unit on Harmful Marine Microalgae presents the main results regarding to investigate the presence of Siwa toxins in fish and Gambier discus in Mediterranean waters, race. She is the quality and technical responsible of the official and accredited laboratory that conducts the Greek HAB monitoring program since 2000. Okay, the main objectives of uh, our team as Aristotle University of Thessaloniki is, uh, in this Eurosigua project was to detect and isolate Cambier discus cells from both uh, Crete and uh, Cyprus, 15 strains from its uh, island, and uh, also to collect uh, about uh, 70 fish individuals from uh, Crete. And uh, in order to do something more scientific, we had also to identify all the Cambier discus isolates uh, collected from the above areas. Uh, since in the first two years of the project, we had already isolated uh, the 13 strains that uh, was our main obligation. We decided, since we had more funds, to, to, to go further for Samlik, not only in uh, Crete, but also in uh, Samos and the uh, Rhodes uh, Islands, covering the northeastern part of the Aegean Sea. So, uh, we, in uh, conclusion, we can say that we have a great diversity of Cabirdiscus and Fukuyua taxa in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, where at least six different taxa were uh, uh, detected and uh, characterized. And uh, this high number of uh, species in the area highlight the risk for Siguatera, despite the fact that uh, <clears throat> uh, very low toxicity was actually found in uh, these isolates that uh, at least the ones that have been examined uh, examined during this uh, Eurosigua project. Dr. Georgios Stavroulakis from State General Laboratory, SGL, presented the results related to sampling of fish in Cyprus and the presence of microalgae of the genus Gambier discus as main producer of the toxin in the environment in Mediterranean waters. He's a food chemist with over 14 years experience in the contaminant sector. He's currently and since 2010 scientific officer at the EFSA Cooperation and Risk Assessment Unit of a State General Laboratory, Cyprus. Yes, so uh, we, we are, we're going to give our contribution uh, uh, in the project uh, after the very good presentation of Katerina. Uh, so, so we uh, we sampled. We, we had one of our, of our main objectives uh, was the fish sampling, uh, and we sampled 82 in total uh, fish uh, species, fish fish uh, items that were sent to ITA for further analysis. Uh, 70 fish was according to the to the pro, to the project. The agreement three. Uh, five Muraina Helena samples were further sent to it uh, as a follow-up action of the uh, um, uh, based on discussion at the fourth annual Yosigo meeting last year in Madeira. 
And there were seven additional field samples uh, that were sent to ITA following an instance of food poisoning in Cyprus. Uh, the, now, the fishing spots uh, were the southern coastal areas of Cyprus, um, the, the, consisting of the Lanaka district, uh, the Paphos district, and, and Limassol. Uh, and, and the result, actually, there were only one fish sample were found positive, CTX like positive. But, but due to the low toxicity, this toxicity was not confirmed by LCMSMS. The coordinator of a specific agreement three, Dr. Jorge Diogin, presents the results on the West Mediterranean, Balearic Islands, and overall contributions. All right, so uh, the last presentation involves the Balearic Islands. So part of the taxonomy, as uh, we pointed out, was on morphology. So um, we were able to identify Fukuya paulensis. This had, this species had already been described in the Balearic Islands, but we extended the, the sampling point, so we found them in other islands. Uh, as for Gambier discus, that was the first identification of Gambier discus in the area. Uh, we isolated uh, several species, uh, several strains, sorry, but the only identified species in, in the Balearic Islands is uh, Gambirdiscus australis. Eh? Gambirdiscus australis actually is also found in Lanzarote, Fuerteventura. These are also examples of work we did with microalgae from the Canary Islands. And these are examples of uh, of many of the work we did, which was basically uh, identifying the strains, uh, harvesting with a known number of microalgae, knowing the volume and evaluating the toxicity through the cell-based assay. Uh, that was another example and doing a balance of the species that have been harvested and which one were toxic and, and which range of toxicity expressed in femtogram per cell equivalent. Okay. Uh, complementary work in addition to the microalgae was the one on the fish. And actually uh, there were no toxic fish identified in the Balearic Islands, but important enough, uh, we have not insisted in previous presentations, so I want to insist now. Uh, we have been uh, addressing uh, almost always muscle, but for some samples we have addressed liver, since that is quite important when evaluating uh, toxicity, since uh, liver has been described as a, a tissue with uh, eventually higher concentrations of thiotoxins. So that's one, one interesting point in the project. Okay, so to wrap up with the conclusions of the Balearic Islands, and uh, some of them have been already addressed in my introduction for the whole project. Uh, Gambier discus was identified for the first time in the Balearic Islands in 2017, confirming the presence of Gambier discus in the Western Mediterranean. Both Gambier discus and Fukuyua have been reported in samples obtained from 2016 to 2019. So. Uh, they are not punctual description, they have been recurrent. So in that sense, they indicate that these genera seem to be well established in the Balearic Islands. Remember that we are in a temperate area with water temperature decreasing quite uh, dramatically in the winter time. Um, Gambierdiscus australis is up to date the only species of Gambierdiscus in the Balearic Islands. Uh, we have demonstrated ciguatoxin-like toxicity in several strains of Gambier discus from the Balearic Islands, and uh, there is no report of toxicity in fish from the Balearic Islands. Before starting with session number three, we will make a special mention in memoriam of Dr. Anne Abraham, a wonderful colleague and dear friend who will be no longer with us, but her meticulous science in the interest of public health and her warm and generous spirit will always be remembered. Rest in peace, dear Anne, you will be surely missed. Specific Agreement 4, led by Dr. Ana Gago Martinez, is aimed to the final characterization of ciguatoxins. 
She's currently sharing responsibilities as professor at the Analytical Chemistry and Food Department of the University of Vigo in Spain and director at European Union Reference Laboratory for Marine Biotoxins. And uh, I will do it as the coordinator of, of the specific grant four. And the objective of this specific grant four was to characterize the risk associated with ciguatera poisoning by developing efficient LCMS methodologies to identify the CTX involved as well as to develop reference materials to be used for further evaluation and characterization. This is more or less the summary of the objectives that we have in our specific grant that I would like to say that was uh, integrated by uh, Philip Hess and his team uh, as a partner of this specific grant. And also, uh, I have to mention that was uh, Professor Yasumoto clearly focused in this specific grant from the very beginning, as well as the other uh, members in the advisory board, uh, Bob Dickey and Ron Menger. Just uh, to focus and to summarize the first part of our work, we had, as I mentioned before, the uh, very close contribution of Professor Yasumoto in this task. And for that, we were base, basing our knowledge on the method that we initially developed with Professor Yasumoto based on the yogi conditions and the method that we had set up in the lab before the project start. From this basis, we tried to optimize the method and we tried to achieve better detection and quantitation limits in order to make the LCMS approach more uh, adequate for the task that we have to perform in the future. So, we uh, try to optimize not only the LCMSMS conditions, but also to work uh, quite intensively in the sample preparation in order to achieve higher recoveries and try to do a better job. I have to say from the very beginning that it was difficult for us since, as you know, the limitation of a standard is the main handicap, handicap of this research. Once more, we had uh, we were fortunate to have collaboration with our colleagues and friends, Professor Yasumoto and Professor Dickey and Professor Manger, who provide us with the tools for us to be able to develop our methodology. So we make a, a job using the standards uh, coming from the Pacific Sigua toxins coming that uh, kindly provided by Professor Yasumoto. And also we use the Caribbean Sigua toxin standard provided by Ron Menger and Bob Dickey. As uh, I will tell you later when I talk about the samples that we analyze, when we first start to apply the samples to the sorry, the method to the samples uh, from the Canary Island, we were able to know that uh, our limit of detection could compromise our job. Therefore, we try to use Abraham method uh, in order to have also a tool to provide uh, a first uh, identification and confirmation. So we use the approach based on Yasumoto's conditions to uh, achieve a better sensitivity monitoring the sodium adult and we had the ability for confirmation by monitoring multiple transitions and specific fram fragments following the method of Abraham with several modifications. We also were uh, using a cell assay as an alternative approach for confirmation. In this particular point, we follow the advice of Professor Manger and Manger uh, had his own protocol that we uh, set up in our lab, a lot of training we had from him, and we were able to even uh, try to, uh, I wouldn't say to optimize, but at least to work hard on trying to identify the main limitations that we had with this essay. We use this alternative approach for confirmation. And through the evaluation of the CTX light toxicity, we, ha we uh, had two different aims, to characterize the CTX toxicity of unknown compounds 
and also to evaluate the efficiency of the fractionation in the toxin purification in the preparation of reference material that I will talk about a bit later. Thanks to this approach, we, were, uh, we will be able to characterize the toxicity of several fractions that we obtained. Then, to a LCMS approach was uh, used for the profile characterization, as I mentioned before, and uh, it was good for us to have a sample that was highly contaminated in our fridge, and this sample was from an, an event of ciguatera fish poisoning in, in Tenerife in 2008. It was a fraction that contains a high content of ciguatoxins, and by using this, uh, this sample, we were able to identify the CCTX1 as well as other uh, compounds that reported in the bibliography that the 1,157, the CCTX1, the 100, um, sorry, the 100, the 1,127, and also certain unknown uh, CTX. These uh, sewa toxins were involved in the sample from the Canary Island that clearly uh, identified the Caribbean profile of this particular sample. We were able also to use the N2A uh, combined with the LCMSMS to confirm the CTX profile characterization of the samples from this project, because as I mentioned before, the sample of this project, the samples that we had, uh, were not uh, concentrated enough in sewa toxins to perform all the experiments that we were planning to perform in the beginning of the project. So here you have two examples of a fish sample from the Canary Island and a field sample from the Selvasen Island in, in, uh, in the archipelago of Madeira. So as you can see here, we were able to identify CCTX1 as the uh, compound, the priority compound in the samples both from Canary Island and Madeira. And we were able also to identify other Caribbean sewa toxins, uh, toxins in the profile of the samples from the Canary Island and also some CTX1 isomer since we obtained the same um, molecular weight but a different retention time. So, um, just to understand a little bit the project that we had to face in, in our specific grant, we had to characterize or confirm the profile of the CTX that were involved in the samples from the Canary Island and Madeira. So, from the Canary Island and Madeira, we got samples that were identified in both in IRT and in the University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria by N2A, and this fish, and also some Guamberdiscus samples that I will also mention later, we were an analyzing these samples using the LCMSMS method that um, we developed in this specific run. So, uh, one once we had these uh, profiles, we confirmed the profiles using the approach that I mentioned before. We identified the CCTX1, we kept the samples that contain CTX for the preparation of reference materials, and in order to get a, sorry, a better information on the profiles of the CTX, we used the approach that I mentioned before, using the fractionation, the toxicity confirmation, in order to uh, be able uh, to uh, characterize the uh, analogs. Once we identify the CCTX1, we also send these samples to the uh, IFREMER and the team of Philip Hess was the one who tried to characterize the CCTX1 or the CTX that we identify by LCMSMS. So, uh, the main conclusions, since I am not going to go through these results, because yesterday you could see the results on the pre fantastic presentation from, uh, from the, our colleagues in the Canary Island, we, uh, and also from, the, from Madeira, I, I just want to summarize all uh, the results that we got. And the main conclusions from these results was specifically the ones I mentioned before. We analyzed 
a quite a high number of samples from the Canary Islands and Madeira. And, but as I mentioned before, the limits, or I mean the levels, the concentration levels of the CCTX1 that we found in, this, in both samples as the main CTX compound were uh, quite low. Only a few samples were, um, I would say, more contaminated than the others. But uh, the main conclusions that I could achieve from this is that apart from the CCTX1, we to identify some other compounds that could be present in these profiles. And this could explain also the discrepancies that we had in the beginning between the N2A and the LCMSMS. In general, I would like to mention that there is, we found a quite good correlation between the N2A and the LCMSMS, and the discrepancies were generally well justified based on the different conditions that we use, the different standards that we were using uh, on different labs, etc. But uh, these discrepancies also confirm that further studies are needed for confirmation of the toxic profiles. But what is clear is that CCTX1 and some of its analogs are present in the samples from the Canary Islands and Madeira, and both of them have a Caribbean ciguatoxin uh, profile. So uh, also as part of our tax, we had to confirm the profile of the Gambier discus that uh, were obtained by IRTA. So in this respect, we were able to make first an LCMS MS analysis of the Gambier discus that we obtained from a specific grant, uh, specific grant three, and in particular by the group of uh, Jorge Diogen. So it, the, the last part of my presentation will be devoted to the uh, preparation of the reference materials. Um, I have to say that when we wrote this project, we were very ambitious because we didn't have the knowledge that we have nowadays. So in the beginning, we thought that we were going to face a uh, easier problem. Unfortunately, the problem was much more complicated than we expected. So as I mentioned before, we found samples that uh, many, many samples sent from the Canary Island, almost 600 kilos of fish, and we were uh, quite frustrated when we realized that the amount of toxin that we had uh, we had in those samples would make impossible for us to develop pure uh, standards or pure uh, or more or less pure reference materials this was also a frustration because in the beginning we expected to be able to provide professor yasumoto with enough material for him to be able to quantify the uh, purify standards by uh, magnetic uh, resonance nuclear magnetic resonance so that was a frustration but at least uh, i will let you know that uh, at the moment uh, we are quite satisfied because following the procedure that Bob Dickey recommend, we were able to perform a quite good job in order to obtain at least laboratory reference materials that will be very useful for people who want to develop or at least set up methodologies in their labs. So we face our work based on the toxin fractionation, on the purification of the CTX standard using different uh, SP approach, also GPC, and finally, we were able to achieve um, the goal that we uh, had to, uh, in a way, use as contingency plan in the beginning. And uh, since uh, due to all this pandemic, we were a bit delayed in, the, in pursuing our uh, results and to be able to work in the lab as much as we wanted. So EFSA gave us the opportunity to extend our uh, experiments until the end of November, but I am happy to announce that at the moment we have, uh, we are being very successful and we uh, are going to obtain uh, reference material from available from this Eurosigua project uh, regarding uh, fish tissue reference material. We have around uh, 12 kilograms of materials autoclave and also purify, or I would say semi-purify materials 
con using, uh, could be used as a laboratory reference material containing CCTX1 that uh, came from the extraction of, and purification of 70 kilograms of fish, of fish tissue and liver. And we have vials containing between 5 to 10 nanograms of CCTX1. I hope that this will be uh, uh, materials that could be of good use for laboratories that wanted to set up the methodologies and to progress in the uh, setting up and uh, optimizing the methodologies in their labs. So just uh, to end, I would like to remark my uh, principal conclusions from this work. In, and the first one is that an efficient CMSMS method has been uh, developed which allow the characterization of CCTX1 as the main responsible for the ciguatera poisoning the European coast selected for this project. But further confirmation uh, was carried out also by LC high resolution mass spec, as well as using the alternative tools that I mentioned in my presentation. The LCMSMS method has been transferred to the European uh, Reference Laboratory for ma uh, Marine Biotoxins to make it available to the URL NRL's network. The low concentration, toxin concentration of the samples evaluated that I mentioned before from the selected areas has been the main limitation that justifies the establishment of contingency plans, not only for the confirmation of the toxic profiles, but also for the toxin isolation and purification required for the preparation of reference material. Neuroblastoma CLSA, played an important role on the accomplishment of this task. The analysis of Gambier Discus SP from the area selected did not allow us to establish a correlation with the CTX profiles obtained for contaminated samples. Nevertheless, several mitotoxin analogs, including new ones, seem to be implicated in the toxic profile of this Gambier Discus. Eframer, as a partner in this specific agreement, is represented by Dr. Philip Hess. He is a specialist on the study of algae toxins implementing chemical testing, method validation and preparation of reference materials and proficiency testing for shellfish toxins. This um Project Eurosigua was um, for us the opportunity to work um, uh, on the confirmation of uh, Sega toxins by high resolution mass spectrometry. And yes, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, it's, uh, as Anna described, a very difficult area uh, since um, there's virtually no standards available commercially um, other than the um, PCTX um, 3C, which is um, the, what had been distributed by WACO. Um, and fortunately, through this and a couple of other projects, we actually got access um, to a number of uh, purified compounds, which did allow us to progress quite nicely in, in the methodology. So the objectives in this um, project, uh, Eurosega, for uh, us specifically, was to look in the optimization of methods for the detection and confirmation of cigotoxins using high resolution mass spectrometry. And um, this is particularly important in that area where no standards are available, because um, when you don't have standards um, with a low resolution mass spectrometry, um, you can uh, confirm that it's um, the same mass and that you might have the same fragments, but uh, because you don't have the retention time, you're not 100% sure about the, 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 the right compound. And obviously with the high resolution, um, you gain a little bit more confidence about the accurate mass, but again, you, you, you have the problems with isomers. Um, another objective was to confirm CTXs in fish and microalgal cultures from the European part of the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean using high resolution mass spectrometry. And can you please go on to the next slide? So um, we started then with method optimization. At the very beginning of the project, um, there was uh, not sufficient 
um, CCTX1 available for us to work on high resolution mass spectrometry. Um, so we worked with several standards that were obtained from Prase Yasumoto and some other sources like Mirai and China um, or uh, the CTX3C from Baco. Um, so we worked more with specific cigotoxins on the method optimization. And there we tried out different stationary phases, solvents, mobile phase additives, um, and were able to optimize for specific sequotoxins. Uh, we also worked on different ion source and mass spectral parameters, um, which differ from those for low resolution mass spectrometry, um, particularly in the ion transmission part of, of the spectrometer. Um, and again, we did that initially on Pacific sequotoxins. And once reference material became available through the hard work at University of Vigo, um, we were able also to uh, try and translate the optimized method parameters for Pacific cigotoxins, then to adapt them to the Caribbean cigotoxins. Um, in between, we had also created a database with accurate masses of CTXs. Um, and please pass to the next slide. Okay, so um, some of the earlier work here um, in the project allowed us to acquire uh, the Pacific cigotoxins in high resolution mass spectrometry in full scan mode. Um, and these type of um, acquisitions allow us to look at the distribution of charges. So for instance, with uh, particular uh, mobile phase conditions or other instrumental parameters to see whether the um, dominant ion species are actually the molecular ion or whether it's a water loss or whether it's um, ammoniated or associated ion. So these are quite important. Uh, it's quite important knowledge whenever you go and transpose the analytical conditions then to lower resolution mass spectrometry, you can simply choose the most abundant ion. Obviously, knowing that the sodium and potassium adducts um, do not easily break down. So when you're looking for very specific methods, um, then you may want to choose molecular or ammoniated ions, even if they're less abundant. Can you go to the next slide, please? So the big drawback of the high resolution mass spectrometry is that the detection um, limits are much, much higher than in triple stage quadrupole mass spectrometry. So when he, that's why I compared here um, the limits of detection and quantification for um, uh, triple stage quadrupole. We have in our laboratory access to um, um, a SIEX instrument, um, API 4000, or an Agilent instrument for the acute uh, TOF technology, time of flight technology. And you can see that this is easily um, 10 to 15 times higher uh, detection limits in the high resolution mass spectrometry for the QTOF, and that makes it even more difficult to obtain sufficient information for confirmation. So while Anna um, and her group have been working very hard on confirmation using different fragment ions uh, with low resolution mass spectrometry, they can do that at significantly lower levels than what we can achieve with high resolution mass spectrometry. Please go to the next slide. It's my concluding slide. Um, so the first part is that optimization of high resolution mass spectrometry methods using Pacific cigotoxins was a helpful exercise for the detection of Caribbean cigotoxins because um, it was only possible to detect uh, the spectrum of CCTX1 once we had optimized the, the methods. So CCTX1 was confirmed in a reference material prepared by University of Vigo and in a fish sample from the Selvagen Islands. Obviously, these were the more concentrated fish samples. Yes, and we also were able to confirm several other metabolites um, in Gambediscus strains from the Balearic Islands and uh, other parts of the Mediterranean Sea, namely Crete, um, mitotoxin-3, gambirone, and gambiric acids. The next session focuses in the rich and extensive experience of Japanese scientists on seawaterra poisoning. The Japanese team is led by Dr. Takeshi Yasumoto, who identified a dinoflagellate in the genus Gambiodiscus as the causative organism. 
He's a worldwide well-known specialist in structural and analytical chemistry, etiology and toxicology on marine toxins as Siwa toxins, among others. Dr. Tomoji Igarashi is an executive managing director in charge of research and development and overseas program in Japan Food Research Laboratories, JFRL. He describes the results of the development and validation of LCMS method for ultra trace analysis of Pacific Siwa toxins in fish. They developed and validated for the first time an LCMS method to quantify the major Siwa toxins occurring in the Pacific. This validation study was carried out by spiking fish flesh with two representative toxins calibrated. The method clears the international action level and satisfies the global standards set by CODEX and AOAC International. As conclusion, a new and robust method to determine Pacific CTXs was established, clearing the validation parameters for above 80% recovery, less than 7% RST small R, detection limit of less than 0.01 ppb for CTX1b and around 0.01 ppb for CTX3c, critical modification and uh, changing the fluorocyl column conditions, and uh, hexan washing and LC column washing to remove interfering substances. Our challenge to the extremely low rate for CTX, namely, 0.01 ppb was changed at clear, so it clears satisfying the validation parameters by the global standard. We have, we hope that this method contributes to public health trade and epidemiology under recognition as the accurate and efficient alternative standard method for CTX's analysis. Dr. Naomasa Oshiro is currently a section chief of the second laboratory, Marine Biotoxin Laboratory, Division of Biomedical Food Research, National Institute of Health Sciences, Japan. He explains the main results on LCMS analysis and reaches service on Siwatera fish poisoning. Epidemiological service produce highly informative results when accompanied by LCMS analysis of fish. To support analysis, a mixture of standard Siwa toxins was prepared. The mixture enabled semi-quantitative determination of toxins by injecting one shot into the LCMS instrument. The genetic type of the local Gambier discus is predictable from the toxin profile in fish. It is my conclusion that two types of cigatoxin reference materials were prepared. One is named NIHS CTX mix containing nine Pacific cigatoxins and the three gambiric, uh, three related compounds. That enables semi-quantitative determination of toxins by injection one shot into the LCMS instrument. The other one's uh, fish meal prepared from contaminated fish flesh of the uh, snapper, the Janus bohor and the Murray-Eel gymnothorax isintina, captured off the Okinawa Japan. Dr. Takeshi Tsumuraya is a professor of biology at Osaka Prefecture University. He studied Group 14, Organometallic Chemistry, at the University of Tsukuba. He explains the development of a practical sandwich ELISA to detect Siwa toxins. The difficulty in preventing Siwateria poisoning comes from the lack of reliable methods for analyzing Siwa toxins in contaminated fish. 
together with the normal appearance, taste and smell of Siwa toxins contaminated fish. Monoclonal antibodies specific against either wing of major Siwa toxins congeners were generated by immunizing mice with rationally designed synthetic haptens KLH conjugated instead of the Siwa toxins. Furthermore, a highly sensitive fluorescence-based sandwich enzyme-linked immunosorbent SA ELISA was developed. This protocol can detect and quantify four major Siwa toxins congeners with a limit of detection of less than one picogram per milliliter. Currently, we are collaborating with a group of Professor Makoto Sasaki, Tohoku University, for the generation of the monoclonal antibodies for the right wing of Caribbean sugar toxins. The synthesis of the hapten is in the final stage, so hopefully we can generate monoclonal antibodies for the right wing of Caribbean sugar toxins very soon. Once we can generate monoclonal antibodies for the left and right wings of Caribbean sugar toxins, I'd like to construct a sandwich ELISA to detect Caribbean sugar toxins. Siwatira research and strategy in other projects around the world will be presented. Siwa Sensing project is presented by Dr. Monica Campas, who is a researcher in the Marine and Continental Waters program at IRTA in Catalonia. Siwa Sensing is a project from the Ministerio de Ciencia e Innovación. The main objective of Siwa Sensing is to provide biotechnological tools for the characterization of the Siwa Tira hazard in order to promote seafood safety and to protect human health. Siwa Sensing has developed bioanalytical tools for the detection of Gambiodiscus fukuyoa species based on an isothermal DNA amplification technique combined with a sandwich high hybridization assay. Siwa Pira project is presented by Dr. Silvio Ulig. He has his research focused mainly on the chemistry and toxicology of toxins from fungi and plants, and more recently, also from marine algae and cyanobacteria. Siwa Pire focuses on three major research objectives. One, to evaluate epiphyte and gambiodiscus community diversity and macrophyte host selectivity in Caribbean coral reef ecosystems. Second, to characterize the metametabolome of these communities structurally elucidate key metabolites and develop methods to evaluate their toxicity and functional role. And third, to identify chemical biomarkers in reef bioindicator species and model their fate in reef food webs. This research was financially supported by the Research Council of Norway and United States National Science Foundation. Dr. Adria Seger, the current research efforts and progress in the implementation of the strategy in Australia and current understanding of CFP in Australia to highlight research Priorities in the fields of epidemiology, ecology, and toxicology are presented by Dr. Adria Seger. He's a postdoctoral research fellow in fish health, biosecurity, and seafood safety at the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies and works for the Safe Fish Seafood Safety and Market Access Program. Siwatera fish poisoning accounts for the majority of food safety outbreaks related to seafood consumption in Australia, with more than 1,650 cases reported since 1965. 
following the 2018 call for data on CFP by the FAO Risk Assessment Panel, the Australian Seafood Safety and Market Access Programme, Safe Fish, facilitated and coordinated a multidisciplinary working group to respond to the request and develop a national research strategy for Australia. This was achieved through a series of teleconferences and a two-day workshop involving researchers, regulators, health department officials and industry representatives. Roundtable The EuroSEWA workshop provided an excellent platform for researchers around the world to discuss the latest findings related to the risk assessment of Siwatira poisoning, as well as for members of public institutions working on risk management options on Siwatira. With Dr. Takeshi Yasumoto, who is pioneer in Siwatoxins research, Dr. Robert Dickey, Director and Chairman of the Department of Marine Science at Marine Science Institute from the University of Texas, and Dr. Ronald Manger, researcher and regional scientific advisor of the United States Food and Drugs Administration, FDA, dealing primarily with the development of cell-based assays for potent marine biotoxins. The awareness of ciguatera fish poisoning is still very low in the medical community and in the public even more so. So it is very difficult to get a firm grasp on the on the level of um, the incidence of ciguatera fish poisonings in the public uh, at large. So, um, but I think the takeaways that I'm getting from, from what I've heard yesterday and today is that it is very well established that ciguatera does originate uh, from a Macronesian area primarily right now. Um, I asked my question yesterday about the Mediterranean for a reason, because there have not been any reported cases from fish that were harvested from the Mediterranean proper that uh, that we heard of. That is not to say that the threat is not still emerging and probably growing at a very slow rate, um, as we see the migration and the establishment of clades of Gambier, Gambier discus in different areas of uh, of the of the globe, um, expanding into more temperate waters, um, uh, along with uh, sea level uh, or sea water temperature rising uh, very gradually um, moving north and south. So um, I think the important takeaways are that, you know, I think you've established, well established, that we've got ciguatera fish poisoning originating from uh, fish from European waters, primarily in the Eastern Atlantic right now. Um, and that's, that's true. We still don't know the frequency. I think that the, in the Canary Islands, the early uh, efforts to um, manage the problem by restricting the harvest of certain species of fish and certain sizes within those species um, was successful in lowering the number of cases and outbreaks that you had from that region. Uh, but I think that uh, without that, uh, the trend would have continued to increase. Um, I think that uh, the number of species of Gambier discus that are being discovered uh, especially in the Mediterranean, is very interesting. Um, it appeared to me more species of Gambier discus coming um, out of the Mediterranean than uh, were uh, noticed in the Macronesian island archipelagos. Um, and I think there's a lot left to be discovered there in terms especially of their relative toxicity. It is, uh, Gambier discus is notorious uh, for their very different levels of toxicity among the various species that have been discovered worldwide. And it's just the same case, I think, in the European waters. Um, the other big takeaway that, uh, that I have from what I've heard today is that CCTX1 appears to be the dominant congener of ciguatoxin found in toxic fish from um, the Eastern Atlantic. And, um, um, and I think uh, that because of the uh, and we heard a lot about uh, about the congeners and the the, the different um, uh, um, forms of ciguatoxin uh, that have been discovered in fish in much lower concentrations. It appears, as it did 20 years ago, um, that uh, in order to manage this this human health risk, 
um, that the methods need to focus on on um, the dominant forms of these toxins in order to uh, develop the sensitive detection methods that we heard a lot of today. And that was a lot of excitement. Uh, I was very excited to hear from, from our Japanese colleagues as well, the, the progress uh, that they've made, um, as well as from Monica, uh, in the detection of low levels of ciguatoxins in uh, both uh, uh, seafood, uh, the fish, but also uh, in, the, in the, the algae themselves. So there's a, there's a lot of progress. A lot of progress has been made. And I think it's uh, the Euro Sigma project has really come together very nicely towards the end of the project today about underreporting. Uh, and that's from lack of awareness uh, of the medical community. So communication strategies are very important to, uh, to make the public and the medical community more aware. Uh, but also uh, developing the methods that are, that are practical. Uh, for high throughput screening of fish that are landed from not only um, in European waters, but also imported fish is still, um, it's the, uh, what, is the, what is the term that's used? It's the golden chalice. We have not hit that yet. Again, I guess I, I'll close really, really quickly that uh, I was very impressed with this workshop. A lot of great information and progress was being, was, has been made. Um, not only in the characterization of the toxins um, and, and the various congeners, uh, but, but also in moving closer and closer to a time when your EFSA or the, the regulatory authorities in Europe will have the, the tools in their hands with which they can better monitor the food supply of seafood and, uh, and be able to prevent uh, toxic fish from hitting our tables. Um, and uh, creating more problems in the health in the health of our of our general population. Um, I'm going to make this very brief uh, in the interest of time. Also, I just have a few uh, statements to make. Uh, it's obvious the Euro uh, Sigwa project has made significant contributions to our knowledge and understanding of Sigwa toxin detection. But in those very early days, uh, we were very limited by the availability of purified uh, Sigwa toxin. Uh, congeners, let alone standards. And it's obvious this is still an issue today, and there's been ex some exciting development as presented in this meeting uh, for the future availability and maybe current availability of some standardized uh, uh, samples. Uh, in the emerging risk jargon, the fact that outbreaks of tropical and subtropical areas had been recorded in the Macaronesia area, plus the increased number of um, autochthonous outbreaks, as we have seen yesterday in the presentation from, from Carmen, are a good example of what we call weak signals. Weak signals that something is changing, something is occurring in Europe. And the conclusion of this discussion is that if we want to pass from a weak signal to an emerging risk, then we need to collect data. And uh, EuroSIG, therefore, started to emerge as a big data collection, data collection project. In order to conduct a comprehensive risk assessment, it's really urgent to continue investigations for being able of retrieving the missing data. And also that adequate risk management measures are needed in Europe. And uh, the information retrieved in the EuroSIGWA project can already provide elements useful for supporting risk managers and providing recommendations for possible control, monitoring, surveillance and other measures with the aim of preventing poisoning. But not only risk assessment, again, as, as Angelo said, uh, one of the main reasons for our interest in this subject area is, is the, the activity that we have on the identification of emerging risks. And this activity is, is kind of a pre-risk assessment activity. We're trying to understand what's going on that poses new challenges to the safety of the food chain. Uh, and often we're dealing with, with areas where there's big lacks of knowledge or data. And with the Ciguatera, what we see is something is changing in European waters. Um, we would like to understand what that is. We have Ciguatera as an example that we're working on, but maybe this is an indication of changes that will bring about many other new 
food safety challenges in European waters. And so that too is a larger aspect that we would uh, like to understand. We're using Ciguatera as a signal of something larger happening. Um, FAO started working on Ciguatera poisoning back in 2015. Uh, when aware of the need of a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team, we had our first interagency meeting, Ciguatera strategy, the global strategy, but it wasn't until 2017 uh, when the fisheries division of FAO was contacted by Pacific uh, nations, raising this issue and asking for guidance on uh, fish, fish protein, and the ban to capture important commercial species due to the fact that they will list as, uh, listed as a potential uh, ciguatoxic fish and it posing uh, a food security uh, threat. And Codex asked uh, for the provision of scientific advice to FAO and WHO to enable the development of risk management options. And after this was when we launched the call for data and the call for experts and hold a, a joint FAO a, a WHO expert meeting in November 2018. And the event resulted in a document that has been recently published, I think it was in May, uh, and, contain, and contains an evaluation of non ciguatoxins uh, geographic distribution, rate of illness, congeners, uh, methods of detention and uh, guidance for the development of risk management options. And also the, the, the document highlights uh, knowledge gaps and leaves very, very clear that there is still work to be done as soon as data becomes available. And uh, with this, I can just say that I learned a lot about this problem uh, in general and in Europe uh, over the last two days, and I hope that you um, read the, the the report of the uh, of the FAO WHO joint expert meeting on seawater poisoning to build on it and to fill some of the gaps identified. And I hope to count on your expertise again in the future to translate science into policy. And why not also to help us in building capacity to manage seawater poisoning in developing countries. And I'm really, really happy with what has done with this project. And working with this group was just uh, fantastic. The knowledge on the expansion of Gambier discourse in the Mediterranean uh, is one key issue, because uh, when we proposed the Balearic Islands, we had no idea about potential presence of Gambier discourse. So that was a clear, uh, interesting result. And then probably the, the wide spectrum of fish uh, that have been demonstrating to have uh, ciguatoxins. It increases information for the Canary Islands government on how to manage ciguatera. Uh, I think this could be uh, two of the related topics that I would highlight. What was very important, in my opinion, was to get to know that uh, Caribbean ciguatoxins are the responsible for, for the contamination of the European waters because that in some way directs our analysis uh, through compounds that are different than the ones that uh, we normally have. I mean, I would say that uh, the standards and reference materials that could be easily available will be the ones from Japan, while the ones from the, Can from the Caribbean are going to be difficult, were difficult to handle the, this particular task in under inside our specific grant, but I think just yes, the fact of uh, being able to know uh, the problem that we are dealing, to have uh, um, available the methodology to look for the main issues in the methodologies it's themselves, I think it's also important in order to, to organize or to plan something for the future, uh, to at least to assess the toxins that uh, will be present. For the epidemiological part, um, um, I, I see that the, to collect the information on Ciguatera cases, it was really hard and the information was really poor and, and, and sparse because it's not mandatory this disease, except for the Canary Island where they have the, all, all the information they have is for, from outbreaks. And what I see as well is that for the Canary Island, that they have a control measure there. Um, the, the measure apply 
are guided by the epidemiological information. When the, the information coming on the size of the fishes of the different species, they, they change this control measure and this uh, works. And, and as well, for instance, for the imported fish into the European Union, we only have two countries, France and Germany, reporting on outbreaks on, on that type of, of fish. And I, I think uh, it is a, a field to, to explore and to, to understand the underestimation, the underdiagnosis and underreporting uh, following these uh, imported fish that uh, has been distributed to many countries but only produce cases or only some uh, countries report cases on, on that. Are these fish swimming across the Atlantic? No, there is locally living fish which um, accumulate these toxins. So we know this is not just an emerging phenomenon from imports, it's not just an emerging phenomenon from fish swimming across the Atlantic, it is an endogenously emerging problem, it, it is a locally emerging problem. Um, so now that we know that it is actually the same species, likely the same species that caused the problem in the western and the eastern Atlantic, um, that it's the same toxins causing the problem in the western and eastern Atlantic. I think the question which, or the clue Tobin actually put to us is, can we start modeling the likely changes of uh, giving us a risk assessment um, by, by uh, general climate change models, uh, general models of global change, increased fishing, increased um, um, uh, impacts on coral reefs, increased uh, trades and, and shipping, um, to actually model the increased risk for this in Europe? I think that uh, the lack of uh, reference standards affects all types of approaches for, for sewer toxin detection. No? But we have to move on with what we have. and. Certainly, uh, I think that if if uh, standards, available standards, although they are may not be certified, are available, these should be shared and should be used as reference in order to harmonize any other issue regarding the methodology to implement for the recognition or quantification of toxins. No? Finding in this project was really not easy, but what would be useful is to look into details how this was becoming in Canary Islands an intoxication that needs national or local surveillance, systematic surveillance. And based on that experience to look into carefully if there could be, let's say, Sentinel Hospital network developed in few countries that would like to be uh, involved. For example, Germany might be interested in this kind of uh, project. Then that could create a network where you could be able to systematically collect information on these cases, everyone, because you have created a network of excellence. And there's no doubt that also in Europe, the Spain is now the leader here. And this is so important from preparedness point of view, that if something really serious happens, there is a place, there are experts, there are centers, there are research groups that you know whom to turn to in case there's a need to address, address ad hoc risk, immediate risk. So I think this is a really excellent example of uh, successful collaboration between not only public health but also particularly food safety and also academia. To define hotspots in where uh, climate change and evolution of things can be uh, tackled uh, in, a, in a better manner. I think going to hot spots in order to do a good sampling to be able to make better reference materials and not to be so costly will be something that will be very important. Just now that we know and we have a pilot, we did a pilot study on how to produce reference materials is going to be very helpful. To me, it's very important to try to work on the method development for human samples. I think this is an issue that should be uh, considered because this will also help the epidemiologist to the case definition, not only based on the food that they eat, but also 
I mean, when they look for the symptoms to try to correlate the symptoms with the with the their own uh, specifications in the blood or whatever.